Thank you all for coming out tonight to the Public Library of New London. And thank you, Cynthia, for, for contacting us and wanting to do this, spread, spread the good word. My pleasure. I really appreciate you coming here. And, and um, for those of you who don't know Cynthia Warren, she is or was an English language fellow in Mozambique for eight months. And she's here to give us a slide talk presentation tonight. So thank you very much. So I'm pretty much going to tell you everything I know about Mozambique and my experience there. I was there on a State Department fellowship uh, called the English Language Fellow Program. And I was posted to a university that was primarily a medical university. I was, in the, I was teaching English for specific purposes for the health sciences. And, uh, but it also had some other departments. It had an architecture department. So it was developing, but it started out in the health sciences. Uh, a lot of my colleagues or a number of my colleagues were from Cuba. So there were a bunch of Cuban dentists and doctors that were teaching anatomy, physiology, dentistry there because there, there is a uh, cooperation between the Mozambican government and Cuba because after independence from the Portuguese, it was a Portuguese colony, uh, it aligned itself with the communist world, the Soviet Union and Cuba. And so it sent a lot of its youth to Cuba to get educated. Uh, and you're going to see that in, in one of the murals. Uh, so I'm going to start the, the pictures now as I talk. I'm going to try a little, diff little different technique this time. You see here a map of Mozambique. And you will see up in the, let me, I can think I'll step over this. You're going to see right up here, Nampula. That is where I was. Now, this whole northern region is, is a heavily Muslim population. Also Christians, but it has a lot of Muslims. And um, as you can see, I lived inland. I was not so fortunate to be on the ocean. Uh, the ocean is gorgeous, the Indian Ocean. I was two and a half hours by car or minivan uh, from the ocean. So I did go to Pemba, which is up there. I did go to Nakala, and I also went to the old Portuguese capital, which is an island off the coast over here. It was the original capital of the Portuguese colony, and it's called Island of Mozambique. In Portuguese, Ilha means island. So when I refer to it in this talk, I'll refer to it as Ilha. It, was, uh, it's, it has colonial buildings, and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, one of my colleagues was uh, an Italian. He worked in the architecture department, and he is um, working on restoring some of these buildings on this Ilia, this island. He's done restorations of palazzos in places like Venice. So he, he was a very interesting man. Um, so you'll see some of my colleagues, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the geography at the time that Columbus and Vasco da Gama were failing to claim lands for their respective crowns. Um, yeah, um, they were basically getting into rivalry. So there was a treaty in 1494, uh, which was brokered by the Vatican, that sort of divided the world into two hemispheres, but this way. Okay, and so there was a certain, they call it meridian, I believe that means longitude, I don't know exactly which one it was, um, by which they divided the globe in half, and this half would be the Spanish could claim lands, and on this half the Portuguese could claim lands. And that is how Mozambique fell within the half that was going to the Portuguese, and so it, it became a Portuguese, Portuguese colony. Um, so let us start looking at some of the other pictures. Uh, this is an old colonial building in Maputo. I first landed in Maputo, which, let's just go back. You see Maputo in the very uh, south with the star. That's the capital. It's a big port. And you can see that, that Mozambique has a border with South Africa. It's, it's bordered by many countries. You can see the countries around it. Um, so that this is a... This was from my hotel window in Maputo. I was in Maputo for three days before I flew north to Nampula, where I worked. Um, and you can see the tiles are sort of falling in. So some of the buildings are in disrepair. Uh, this is on the flag of Mozambique, but it's actually painted on a mural in Nampula, the city where I lived. 
Um, you've got the hoe and you've got the gun that's supposed to be laid down because, you know, after, after the war is over, the Independence War, the gun, the rifle or whatever it is, uh, would be laid down. Uh, so uh, the thing is, though, that th it was the last country in Africa to win independence from a colonial power, and that was in 1975. The others began like in the early 60s. I believe Ghana was the first. So it was the very last one, and there was an independent sort of a guerrilla war going on with people up north over the border in Tanzania. The, the freedom fighters, they would come in the country over the border from Tanzania to wage the war against the Portuguese. The thing that really tipped the balance and won the war was that in Portugal there was a coup d'etat, okay, so that, that, that the, the, the army took over the government um, and deposed the leader in Portugal, and so therefore the Portuguese became weak and they couldn't keep the colony. So, so Mozambique won independence. Um, and as I told you before, it was aligned with uh, the communist world. Now, the man there... The, the general holding up his hand, he is the national hero, the father of the country. There's another man who's also the father of the country. His name was Eduardo Mondlane, but he, um, he was, I believe he was assassinated. And Samora Machel died in a plane crash, which they also think might have been an assassination. It's, it's, it gets investigated and reinvestigated every now and then. But... Um, but anyway, this, this mural is at a traffic circle with a, a statue of Samora Michel in the middle. And uh, this, you know, I, I started, now I, I was really worried about taking pictures because I thought maybe people wouldn't like it and they would be maybe hostile. I had traveled in Senegal and people were quite hostile about picture taking in West Africa where I had been. But the thing was, people here, were they were jumping in front of my camera like jackrabbits. It was, <laughs> it was really wonderful. Um, and a lot of them probably, I think they had never seen an image of themselves before. So it was truly a wonderful place to take photographs. Um, so back to the mural. Here we have in Portuguese, which is the official language, um, uh, long live the... the sort of the lessons of production, which I guess would be about, you know, socialism, right? And this is the fight continues. Abaixo uh, shinkonyoka, shinkonyoka is a local word, I'm not sure what it means. But here again, this is the formation of the new man. That was sort of the thing about communism and socialism, that a new man would be um, created by the new system. And here you see people going off to Cuba and to the USSR. Now, in Portuguese, it would have different uh, acronym, URSS, there. So they're going off to study, get higher education in these countries that they were cooperating in with. But actually, Mozambique is no longer that way. It's pretty much another capitalist country now. Um, it, it, but still, the, the main party... Okay, this is an interesting thing. You see down there, it says Caso Bashir. This means the Bashir case. This man is the, I believe he's the public affairs officer of the U.S. Embassy in Maputo. And he was on TV on the night, night evening news. Now, I had a lot of, we had a lot of power outages where I lived as well as the TV would freeze every now and then. And this guy's face was on the TV from something like, 7 p.m. till the very next morning. I kept turning it back on. Oh, my God, he's still there. And I got alarmed because I thought, I thought somebody, they've purposely done this because they really want to get a good look at him because they're going to try to assassinate him or something, you know. I mean, I, and, of course, I, I talked to the embassy later. They said, oh, no, that happens all the time. But anyway, the thing is, this Bashir, his name is Mohammed Suleiman Bashir. He is supposedly, the, the, the U.S. government says he is a, um, drug trafficker. And of course, drug traffickers, especially in, the, in Eastern, this is Southeastern Africa, are going to be suspect for funding terrorism. Um, when in Maputo, he owns a huge shopping complex which American citizens are prohibited from going in. Okay, we cannot go in it. He is on, you know, a blacklist of the U.S. government. And so he was being interviewed and then it froze. So the story never really got out that night. It was just, I thought that was very strange. Okay, and this man, he, is, he worked at the um, military academy. He, he's actually an English teacher. And he was, uh, he was 
he was brought to the U.S. to get his English training and his, and his teacher training at the Defense Language Institute. So I worked with him a bit. And uh, now we're going to talk about tradition. Uh, these things, these pieces of cloth are called capulanas. I want to show you my outfit. My outfit is made from a capulana. Now there's lots of tailors and you can have things for ver made for very, very cheap. So you can see the really interesting thing is that they use these often as billboards. Now this one doesn't have a political candidate. This is a saint. And it's in French because the guy who ran this shop happened to be from a French-speaking African country. He's not Mozambican. He's from Cameroon, West Africa. And so he, they, they bring in you know, these, these textiles from other countries as well. So it has uh, words on it that says, to serve, to serve is to give pleasure. To, to serve is to give is to get pleasure. To serve is to get pleasure. So she, this, this is a saint, but there's also... Did you see it well enough? There it is, okay. They, you also see political figures on these capulanas, so that they're really, that when the women wear them, and it's women that wear them as long skirts, they're unconstructed, they don't sew them, they, um, they're, they're walking billboards for political candidates. Okay, now this guy was from Congo, and he, uh, he also spoke French. And uh, he very much wanted me to bring him to the U.S. He was constantly lobbying me. <laughs> he was a very nice guy. <laughs> Actually, he has, um, I think his sister lives in Chicago. So I said, well, you better work on your sister. <laughs> okay. And this guy was my tailor. He made me this outfit from the Capulana. Uh, okay. Um, this is the president of Mozambique. Um, and, of course, just like, you know, Obama or our president's portrait, you know, hanging everywhere. So... His name is Armando Gabuza. His portrait's hanging everywhere in public buildings and schools, etc. cetera. Uh, and, of course, this is a good way, obviously, to, you know, get the candidate's face out there. You, what, are the, what do you call these things? Uh, post up poster boards? What do you call Handbills. Handbills. Plastering handbills all over the market. They get kind of dirty and tawdry. But what's better than that? Having your face on a capulana. This is the president's face on a capulana. Should I turn the lights off? Or at least one of them, perhaps. The front. There we go. How's that? Oh, okay. But the image is clear? Okay. So anyway, it, so these are bolts of fabric that they cut the capulanas from. There he is again. So you can, you know, uh, and you see the drums. It's very, very interesting. Now, what I found really odd and a little bit sacrilegious, I thought, was when a woman would have on a capulana with, uh, like, for example, the Madonna. Excuse me, by I don't mean to be disrespectful. This is simply something I observed. Would be right here. And she, and I was behind a woman in church. She had on a capulana. And it, like this, it had Madonnas all over it. And then she sat down. And basically... She sat down on top of the Madonna, and I was thinking, that's really, I, they don't think about it as being disrespectful, but I think we would think that way. Um, these are armaments from the Civil War. Now, as soon as the Independence War was won, the Civil War began, as often happens, because people don't agree. Okay, so the oppressor was overthrown, and then the Civil War began. And, and now art is made from these various uh, pistols, machine guns, etc. This is a porch swinging chair. A bench, and then you get a close-up of the back of the bench, revolvers or whatever they are. I'm not really up on my armaments. Um, now, this talking about the wars, the game, the big game was very decimated by war. You know, people are out, you know, the animals are getting caught in the crossfire. But at the, at the Museum of Natural History in, in um, Maputo, they had a series of elephant fetuses on display, as well as stuffed animals. So you see the umbilical cord, and it shows the gestation development of the elephant, which was, uh, I think that's a very beautiful image. He looks so, so peaceful. <laughs> Okay, and then this is ebony. Of course, that is, we shouldn't be buying ebony, but it was very, in Nampula, there was a lot of uh, ebony at the Sunday market, and people said, oh, yeah, the Chinese come in and buy it all up. You know, so I'm, 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 I'm looking at the stuff saying, oh, I'm not going to buy that. And they said, well, that, we don't need you to buy that. You know, we got, we've got big buyers. They'll just come in and buy the whole lot, you know. Um, and uh, this is a lion claw, 
uh, this is at the Ethnographic Museum in Nampula. Behind the museum, there was a lot of wood carvers and people doing handicrafts. And they were going to turn these uh, lion claws into jewelry. So it was, you know, gulp. You know, I, I felt a little sad seeing that when you see the fur still on there and everything. And you wonder, you know, how it was, you know, obviously it seems like it was probably poached on some protected, uh, in the, some protected game park. Uh, and here the guy is carving um, ebony, which is called black wood, pau preto, in Portuguese. This is still in Maputo. Now, this is another tradition. It's called musiro. And the women take a, a, a certain kind of wood, they grind it, mix it with water, and they use it um, for, uh, to soften the skin, to protect themselves against the sun, and for cultural reasons. Apparently, they use it all over the whole body um, before the wedding to soften the skin. And also, it can indicate status, such as whether or not somebody's married or, or, or that their husband has been away for a while. I don't know what that's supposed to signal, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to show you a series of these, um, these women with the musiro, but I think I will play a little music to go along with that because that always enhances it. Let's see. I think she looks like Aretha Franklin. As I say, I, I lived inland, not on the ocean, and there was it, the whole landscape was this red dust. Um, beautiful color, sort of an orange color, and then the whole, and then there were these granite extrusions or whatever you call them, which here we in English we call monadnocks, just like Mount Monadnock. It's sort of a granite thick mountain that just thrusts itself up from the flat plain. Um, and uh, there they call it a German word, which is Inselberg, which apparently means island mountain. So it is sort of like an island mountain. So red dust, monadnocks everywhere, and also termite towers. There were just termite towers everywhere, even on the campus. There were two campuses. One was sort of at the edge of the city, and the other was out. I called it the Bush Campus, because it was really out on a road that went past little settlements and villages, thatched houses and stuff like that. So I really like that. Um, that the flora and fauna, well, there's a lot of timber, a lot of fruit, especially mangoes. The whole bush campus was a mango orchard, really. Um, you could just pick mangoes off the trees and eat them at the bush campus. Um, also, the, the thing about uh, they ate bush meat, and the way they hunted for bush meat was by setting the, the bush on fire. They would just start a fire, and, and, and the fire would be like a wildfire almost, and then the, the animals would come running out. And so that's, that's the way they hunted for bushmeat. Now, the city itself had a lot of tree-lined streets, 
And uh, the tree's main tree was acacia tree, but there were also a lot of po beautiful poinsettias, which have a red flower. Um, you'll see murals, of, murals everywhere of this Mama Africa rice. But um, there was, Mama Africa rice was popular, but actually it wasn't even produced in Africa. It was imported from Thailand. Uh, globalization. Uh, where I lived was right next to a bar and a, an, a, an evangelical church. So, uh, so there was the bar was above and the church was below. Um, wait a minute, sorry. Uh, the church was below. Um, and there was a lot of litter in the town. There was a real lot of litter. Uh, people would, ju they would uh, dump over dumpsters and go through the trash. And they'd also burn the trash right at the side of the road. Um, uh, also, the, the tree roots were used as public bathrooms by men. They would, they would urinate on the tree roots because there were no public toilets in the town. And many people worked as hawkers. They would come in just for the day to sell their wares. There were peddlers everywhere. And um, so they, uh, there were no public um, toilets. It's interesting because, as I saw in the New York Times the other day, it says, like in India, there are more cell phones than public toilets. So which is the more basic need? Well, I don't know. You know, it seems pretty obvious. Uh, so in a way, it was... It was kind of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say ex exactly disgusting. I kind of got used to it. But it was, it was, it was kind of sad and pathetic that, that nothing was provided for people who were there trying to make a living and had nowhere else to basically attend to their, their basic needs. Um, you're going to see a few of my colleagues from the university. The rector of the university has like a PhD in something like wildlife management, and he helped to found a, a game park on the border of Mozambique and another neighboring country. Um, I also worked in the Access Micro Scholarship Program, which is a program of the U.S. Embassy to reach disadvantaged youth in a two-year after-school English program. Um, uh, they, so I, I, I did an intake, I did testing of these students and interviewing of these students, um, asking them such questions as how many meals a day do you eat, what do you eat, what kind of a house do you live in, because they had to prove that they were disadvantaged in order to get the scholarship. Um, and we'll also see the Bush campus. The Bush campus is interesting because you see the termite towers that are growing, that are, are you know, right next to the dormitories. They take over trees and just eat up trees. Um, and what was interesting is that the new camp, the Bush campus was being constructed by the Chinese, and several Chinese died of malaria. And so they, <clears throat> They did an investigation on the Bush campus, which was large, and found some small cemeteries. So the Chinese believed that because they were sleeping with their head toward a cemetery, that that's why these guys died. It was actually from malaria that they did not do anything about. But they, because of all the superstition, the rector brought in a curandero, or you know, I don't want to use the word witch doctor, a traditional healer, to do a ceremony like an exorcism of the campus so that it would be safe for the Chinese to stay there and continue constructing. Um, and I also, you'll see some interesting slides of uh, women foraging for wood that they didn't have enough money to buy charcoal. Most people cook with charcoal that's made there, but they didn't have enough money so they were out and they were on the campus with their hatchet looking for wood to cut. Um, so the, the, the Bush campus was an incredibly mellow place. It, it, it was so peaceful there. So let's take a look at these slides. This is my first African sunrise from the plain. And there are the Monadnocks. That's uh, the horizon from my apartment building. It's the cathedral. That almost looks like a painting. One of the red dust roads. And that's the first termite tower you'll see. It's a very slender one. Some of them are quite stocky. I climbed one of the Monadnocks with a few people one of the climbable ones. You can see the diversity of shapes on these monadnocks. It's 
a very dramatic landscape and flying in was very, very beautiful. I think that's some kind of a crow. I always thought of that crow as being an integrated crow. The timber is an issue. The Chinese are illegally taking timber and it's been confiscated in big freighter containers in the port of Maputo. There's the Mama Africana. These are the tree lined streets. I lived in the white building to the right, the bars above, the churches below. And of course, there's a pool hall in the bar with a red pool table. I'd never seen a red one before. That's a really old church from the Portuguese time. The gate was always locked, although I heard music coming from it, but I never got in there. This is a typical site of the dumpsters being dumped over and the trash gone through. And those red petals, that's from the poinciana tree. But as I said, that would be the public toilet there. a school and they're burning the trash there. This is the university I worked at, Universidad de Lurio, and that is the rector. He was my first contact, but he was reassigned to Maputo. He's the one that told me that practically all the Okay, this guy was my main colleague from Zimbabwe. He came to teach there because the economy was so bad in Zimbabwe. This man was a pedagogical director and a veterinarian. He was the pedagogical director of the Access Program, the program for disadvantaged youth. And they worked at, in that same program. Two optometry students. You can see the one on the left may have some Arab or Indian heritage. one of my students. I did a lesson on the Great Migration and used the pictures of Jacob Lawrence, which was a good lesson. They got into it. This student had a different hairdo every day. That was my favorite. This is at Musa Binbike University. This is called the American Corner. It's another program supported by the embassy. This guy was the first guy to graduate in his family, and his mother very proudly made a speech. I went to the graduation party in the bairro. The bairro is, means like barrio in Spanish, which is the thatched hut type of uh, part of the city. There's a termite tower next to the dorm. Okay. Okay, these are some of the workers at the campus, at the Bush campus. This may look a little stagey, but I asked him to pose, and it definitely looks posed. You can see the termite tower completely took over that tree, and they're, they're taking it down with pickaxes. They use the material for building because it's supposed to be very strong. He ran a concession on campus. He's eating sugar cane. And there's the woodchopper lady that I met just as I was rambling around. People thought I was very courageous for wandering around the bush alone. People on campus, you know, apparently there's cobras. Yeah, so these are the students. They all had to wear these white doctor's coats in the health sciences program. More termite towers. 
was a very mellow place, a nice place to go take a nap. I, I wandered around and just relaxed there so much because I lived in the, in the middle of the business district in an apartment building, which next to the bar, it was noisy. I had to wear earplugs. So the Bush campus was a great haven for me. They were taken by surprise, but apparently they enjoyed my taking their picture. Now, this is an interesting picture. This was right outside my window in the apartment building, and it was basically a urinal. I mean, it was used all day long, and I, I saw people all day long turning their, their backs to me and facing the wall. So, uh, but, you know, like I say, if you don't have any facilities, what are you going to do? Um, like I said, I thought I would have trouble... Um, taking pictures because I thought people wouldn't like it. But in fact, it's interesting that I was, uh, so I, I did my first picture taking from my balcony and because they were building a huge building right next door and there were a lot of construction workers. So I, and I had a really good zoom on my camera. So I started taking, I, and, I, and I also had a balcony facing a busy street and there's many people hawking wares. The whole city is like a huge market, people carrying things on their heads, hawking wares. So, it, so the balcony was a wonderful vantage point for taking pictures um, and the construction workers were among the first pictures I took. But as I say, then I later found that people really liked my taking their pictures. So I would just, it was my just great, my main pastime, there was no real entertainment there, was to walk around taking pictures of people. And I did get robbed and pickpocketed a few, a couple, two, three times, but I'll tell you those stories in a few minutes. So just to, to talk about the picture taking, now we're going to talk about health. This is a very important, important issue because actually I went there, my main assignment was to teach English for the Health Sciences. So this is, a, this is the university's uh, a lab, with, you know, anatomy lab. Um, and this is one of my Cuban colleagues. She's, uh, she's of African heritage and she was absolutely tickled pink to be living in Mozambique and in Africa. She was just so happy. She was very surprised I knew about Santeria which is sort of traditional, traditional medicine and, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't like using all these derogative terms like, uh, you know, uh, witch doctor, craft, or black magic. These are the kind of, you know, derogatory terms that have been used. But it was interesting because she came in my apartment. I had a really bad time with the malaria medication I was taking. It was making me crazy. It's called larium or mefloquine. It's a prophylaxis. You're supposed to take one a week for two weeks before you go there, the whole time you're there, and two weeks after, which is not too great for your kidneys and liver. But it also has side effects on some people, which makes you slightly psychotic and, uh, and depressed. And, and, you know, like I had imaginings that were quite horrible, and I actually was very, very upset. So I discontinued it. Um, but she came in one day, and I invited them, the Cubans, over for a drink, and she told me my apartment was haunted. So she told me I should take a glass of water, put a small crucifix in it that I bought over at the cathedral and keep it under the bed or on top of the refrigerator or something. And then after that, let it be there a while, then take the crucifix out, drink the water. She had a lot. She was very interesting. I mean, she was a dentist, uh, <laughs> but, but she, was a, she was into traditional medicine on the side. Well, I mean, maybe she had, was into traditional medicine for dentistry as well. We didn't talk about that. So that's me going crazy inside the mosquito net. Uh, I, that, that, that mosquito net I bought over 20 years ago in Bangladesh when I lived there, but I've kept it all these years, so I took it there with me. And let me tell you, I got to the point where I was just beside myself. I even told my colleague who lived upstairs, I said, you know, if I come in the middle of the night and knock on your door and say, you know, please, you know, hold me down because I want to jump off the balcony, I said, I said you'll let me in, won't you? Sure. Because the medicine was really, really, I was not... The, a person to take this medicine. And as a matter of fact, um, there are warnings on the, the fine print that says it, it, has been, it hasn't been proven, but they, they, that some people have committed suicide, but it doesn't, hasn't been proven that it's linked to larium. However, I got so desperate about it that I went online and I found an anti-larium action group. I wrote to them, told them, told them my whole story, and, and I told them I'm getting off it. And they, they wrote me back, and they were very supportive. And if it hadn't been for them, I don't know if I, you know, I mean, that was helpful to me to stop taking it. The thing was that 
There were a lot of expats there, long timers. There was an American guy who had been there 25 years. Nobody was taking malaria medication, absolutely nobody. Um, they basically, because it's, it's a very d dangerous kind of malaria, uh, malaria there, um, I think it's called Falpicarum plasmodium or something like that. Uh, it's one of the worst kinds because it can become cerebral, and, and if you don't treat it immediately, y you're a goner. And as a matter of fact, one of our students at the university before I got there, which was unbelievable to me until I realized the mix between modern medicine and traditional medicine there, apparently 70% of the population believes more in traditional medicine than modern medicine. They don't trust hospitals. This student was a medical student. She got malaria. Her family took her to the hospital. They gave her a drug that made her have a very bad allergic reaction. The family freaked out and said, this is going to kill her. We're taking her to a curandero. It's from the word cure, right? The curandero is a traditional healer. They took her to the curandero, and, and many Mozambicans respect curanderos, except for the fact that oftentimes they get dosages wrong, and there are some, you know, things that can make it that their medicine is not effective, their treatment's not effective. She died, and, uh, and many uh, groups of students had gone to the family begging them to take her back to the hospital, but they refused, and she died. So, so malaria is a really big thing there. But as I say, because it's such a big thing, it's easy to get tested. You can get tested for three bucks there. You know how much it cost me to get tested here? $141, you know? And, uh, and the thing is, because everybody, you know, it's, it's so endemic. It's, it's just so widespread there. The other thing about it is uh, that there's a, there, they have remedies so readily available. And as soon as you, as soon as you test that positive, you, you just take the remedy. However, it is true, some people are allergic to some of the different remedies. Okay, so this is a propaganda, or actually propaganda is not the right word in English. Uh, it's, you know, trying to promote sleeping under a net. I asked my medical student, the students in the general medicine class, I was teaching them English for medicine. They, um, I said, how many of you sleep under a net? And they all said yes, except one woman. And all the rest of the students started making fun of her. But she says, oh, I feel suffocated under a net. I can't sleep under a net. Uh, and I actually, I, do, I also felt somewhat suffocated under the net. OK, so these are the roots and herbs of the curandero for all these different remedies. And you see these all around town on the sidewalk. He's a curandero. I was going around with my, tele, with my uh, camera at the Sunday market, and he saw me, and he wanted me to come take his picture. And that, that's how he greeted me. So follow me, he said. And off we went to see his wares. I'm not sure what those horse tails are for. Probably some, you know, I don't know, some whisking you, some, some incantation perhaps, and some, you know, making the breezes come. So he has all of his stuff labeled. He knows his stuff. And this concoction in the bottle, I have no idea what it was for. We didn't really talk about any particular ailments. Uh, again, you know, this is, says that, you know, the maternal milk is the best thing for your baby. You should uh, breastfeed for six months. So there were murals that were getting out mess health messages in the city. Uh, I'm not sure what the message here is. <laughs> Didn't have any words with it. But it's funny because uh, we're going to see more babies. And the thing, this thing about here in the U.S. attachment parenting, which apparently is very uh, popular now, um, the thing about you're supposed to sleep with the infant, to carry the infant all the time. But, and I was saying, you know, that you see how she's carrying infants. I never actually saw a mother carrying two babies. And I was told by somebody that, once one baby can start walking, they kind of like, that, that's the end of the attachment, you know, it's, uh, because they, they have to have another one. You know, the second one needs to, needs to, can't walk, so needs to be bound to her body. They carry the babies, you know, in slings. Okay, this is an albino, an al uh, a person with albinism. You're not supposed to say albino. Um, but at the albino... People with albinism in Mozambique are protected. I mean, they, 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 there's no weird sort of um, beliefs that parts of their body or, or their hair have magic properties. But apparently in Tanzania, there have been lots of killings of these people to get parts of their bodies. They're considered charms. Um, one example is that the, if you weave the hair of, an al of a person with albinism in a fishing net, you'll catch more fish. It will bring, you know, a, a body part will bring wealth. And apparently this, uh, these beliefs have been promoted by these so-called juju priests from Nigeria. 
Uh, I, there was a big article about it. I, I believe it was in the New York Times. Uh, so this, these are taken from my balcony. Um, and then you see, of course, here, virus, 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 same word in Portuguese, virus. And the cobra, of course, what is it talking about? HIV. Okay, so there's a lot of murals around town. Uh, HIV is high there. They get big donations from the Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation to fight HIV. But the word is that the government doesn't want the HIV um, uh, rates to go down because then they still won't get the money from the Gates and then they won't be able to, to you know, kind of like skim, skim off the top. This is just, you know, I, uncorroborated. Of course, I'm just, you know, telling you some stories. Uh, but, but, and also USAID pours, U, 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 US Agency for International Development pours money into sort of a television program where they have debates and, and forums of the public about uh, HIV and how to stop it. The thing is, as you can see, this is a condom ad. It's a big billboard in downtown Maputo. I was really surprised. I'd never seen a billboard like that before in my life anywhere. Um, so that's how important it is and, and how, you know, a lot of people, because of the uh, um, uh, traditions of polygamy uh, in, you know, traditional tribal culture, this whole idea of monogamy or staying with one person is not really, you know, in the culture that much, it's more polygamous, therefore, you know, having multiple partners, um, so that they have, they have these things called sexual networks, and so they, there's this sort of complacency where you think if you're just with one person, and they're not going off with someone else, and yet they are, and you are too, and, and so that it gets spread that way. This is another mural. Uh, it says that the, the worker cannot be discriminated against for any motive for any reason so that if, if someone is known to be HIV positive they, they cannot lose their job okay and they cannot have compulsory testing so that the, the words near this would say you, you do you, you do not have to take an HIV test they cannot make you do that okay and so this guy is saying I only need the antiretrovirus boss okay I'm gonna get better please don't throw me out so this is all trying to protect the worker that may be infected with HIV. Okay, now, t sexuality, I mean, I thought, you know, I, I think that, you know, I went from working in Afghanistan, a, a country where, you know, nobody talks about sex, to a place where sexuality is just, just out in the open everywhere. And this is a mural at the university. A mural. Look at the breasts. I mean, did they have to do that? I think that's a pretty sexualized uh, medical, uh, what do you call it, Me painting of a sort of a medical diagram. And so, so I think that this sexualizing is sort of, you know, obviously contributes to the spread of HIV. Um, this was a girl on the street during one of the celebrations, a Muslim celebration. You know, I, I just was amazed that whenever girls posed, they were incredibly coy. Not that young girls aren't coy, but I found them exceptionally coy and flirtatious. Now, it's a big problem in the schools, too. If you see, he's got a paper behind his back, and it's a low grade, and he's saying to her, apparently he's the teacher, he's saying to her, if, you know, hey, your grade's really low. You want to pass my class? I think we can have a conversation. This is about sex for grades, okay? Likewise, the not only the teacher tries to corrupt the student, the student tries to corrupt the, the teacher. So the student might say, oh, well, you know, please raise my grade and, uh, you know, and, you know, we can have a conversation, right? And uh, so that this was right out, this mural was right outside the school. It's right out there. But look at this. Uh, these are two students of the access program that I taught in. And I did a 4th of July presentation about Paul Revere there. You can see a famous painting in, on the screen there by Copley of Paul Revere. And, I, I, I thought, and, and the students had given, like, so they had done some exercise and they had given some little oral presentations about the various things we'd done and what we'd talked about with the 4th of July. And then at the very end, class was over and I said, does anybody want to have their picture taken with Paul Revere, you know? Because I needed pictures, you know? And they got in these sexy poses. I was, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked. I, I thought, is this about their education or they just want to have their picture taken, you know? It was really surprised me. Another thing, a medical thing, is that there, there are quite a number of handicapped people. They do not have wheelchairs. They have these hand-cranked bicycles. 
and I think a lot of these are donated by the mosques, as I, as I understood. Again, these were taken from my balcony. Because with my really good Zoom, I had a, a great opportunity because it was an amazing amount of activity. Um, there was a lot of tent clinics. This particular one the, the, on the tent was written, Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of humanity. And uh, so apparently Saudi Arabia was funding this particular clinic. But I think USAID also was uh, cooperating in that. And the university would have clinics too. One day the university had a culture day and at the same time outside the um, stadium where they had this traditional dancing, they had clinics um, where, and a lot of old people come to these clinics. Now old people can have it bad in Mozambique because there is some el there's some elder abuse um, that when a person is not productive anymore, she, she or he might be made to live in the chicken coop. Uh, and not given very much food because they're not contributing. And of course, people are, a lot of people are poor. And so if they, it's sort of like if you can't contribute, you're not going to get anything. So it is, it is quite a, an issue. The Muslims there, I found, I've lived in several Muslim countries. Uh, I found them to be exceptionally mellow, very mellow. Um, and this guy was uh, the priest or imam. And, he, I, I want to take his picture, and every day after that, he waved to me and smiled at me. He was just, a, just, so, uh, just, just so warm. It was really nice. And those hats, these particular prayer caps are from Tanzania. I think they're exceptionally beautiful. They tend to be higher than a lot of prayer, prayer caps. Some prayer caps are more like skull caps. Okay, and so I went to the um, stadium where there was a, the Muslims prayed on one of the Muslim holidays, the holiday of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, so I went and uh, took pictures of them praying. There's somebody arriving. I don't know how I got this picture. I got this picture by accident, I swear. I would just click, click, click. And when I looked back at my picture, I said, wow, this is amazing. I couldn't believe I got that picture. But anyway, so all the women are on one side of the stadium, the men on the other side, and they're separated by an expanse of sand. And of course, you see the Kapulanas are so colorful when they're all together. Then, of course, they bow. They bow and put their head, foreheads to the ground. You can see the men on the other side. And then the men putting their foreheads to the ground. That one guy in orange, he didn't quite get... <laughs> I think that's interesting how the guy in orange is sort of sticking up there. Okay, and then I've got some portraits of people. Again, these are all Muslims in this folder. I took these from the balcony. These women were waiting in front of the pharmacy around the time in, during Ramadan. You see, one woman has Musiro on her face. Students. This was Eid, or the celebration when Ramadan, or the fasting period, finishes. USA, see his t-shirt there?
lot of thumbs up gesture if they like something, which is very common in Brazil as well. Of course, I thought maybe there'd be a connection because of the Portuguese background. You can sort of see a prayer mark on his forehead. Everybody carries stuff on their head. And they just can, you know, they can operate in normal fashion, stepping off curbs, looking both ways. Although oftentimes they'll use one hand to stabilize it. But they can, they can do lots of things without using their hands at all. Um, uh, that the babies are carried in slings, usually on the back, sometimes in the front. They can be swung around from front to back when they're crying so they can breastfeed. There's breastfeeding done in public. It's, it's just perfectly normal. Um, there's going to be several sequences you're going to see that show people loading. I call it loading their heads because, you know, they've got their head load, whatever they're carrying. They've got to get it down, make their sail, and get it back up. Sometimes it's something light. Sometimes it's something really heavy. You know, you're going to see a few sequences of this. The girls often carry coconuts. The coconuts are heavy. And also trays of bananas. The bananas don't tend to be heavy. Uh, but the men were carrying these heavy baskets of sweet potatoes, pineapples, and pretty heavy things. Um, as far as children uh, carrying head loads, it is, you know, could be detrimental to the development of their skulls and their brains. But children also do carry things on their heads. And in fact, it's really odd that people will prefer to carry something on their head, if, no matter if they could just very light and they could just carry it in their hand. Like one woman is carrying one root on her head. You know, a root, just a root. And another guy, there's a lot of them, um, as I say, there's a lot of peddlers, hawkers walking around, a lot of used clothing and used shoes. Um, uh, and, you know, a guy might have, uh, he might have a bag full of shoes, but he will carry one shoe on his head, advertising shoes. And you'll see a guy with a shoe on his head. Um, let's see. In order, how do you carry it? Do you, some people put it straight on their skull without any cushion, but oftentimes uh, the, uh, the women especially will take a capulana, coil it into sort of a donut, put it on their head, and that will cushion their head from the load. Okay, so as you, um, oh, the other thing about um, the women carrying the babies is that they don't need any daycare. Okay, they, the babe, they're out there hawking, they're out there working, or they sell street food, whatever they're selling. Uh, they sit in groups on street corners with their kids with them. Often they're selling peanuts. Um, and, uh, and so the baby's right there. Uh, so it's, it's pretty, whoops, oh, this fell off. Can you still hear me? Okay. All right, so these are, this is babies, babies in head loads. And that baby's, <laughs> baby's at the party sleeping on her back. And they carry babies even when they get pretty big. That's a big baby and that's a little baby. Parasols are very, very popular and I carried one most of the time myself. Take note of all the things you're seeing them carrying. Great diversity. They'll carry anything and everything on their heads. I wish I could do it. This is a sequence. A woman's washing up. A little bit out of focus. I took it through a screen. Baby's very curious about the clothes washing. <laughs> the whole family on one motorcycle. That's very common in India, too. Probably in most developing countries. I don't know if you can call India a developing country anymore. <laughs> And boys and men also carry babies, but you don't see it too often. Okay, she's going to swing that baby around front. 
so I get a good picture of the, with her with the baby. I think she's so beautiful. She told me she. Oh, here's a sequence. This is a capulana. She's going to make it into a donut. You see. And there's her uh, basket of coconuts down the lower left. Now it's heavy. She's going to get some guys to help her hoist it. I don't know if she got them to do it or if they just rushed up to her assistance without being asked. It looks to me like they just came along and helped. And off she goes. Here's another one. Now look at the mango she's got. That fell off a tree, she wants to keep that mango. She's got the mango in her hand. And off she goes with her mango. Now I had a really good um, view of the intersection from my balcony. So I could get a lot of pictures from my balcony of people crossing the street. He's got like, um, you know what, rubber thongs and stuff, children's shoes on his head. The intersection was really good for getting sort of kind of like silhouettes. And there were a lot of shadows in the, those are chickens. There were a lot of shadows in the city. There were tree-lined streets and they, they pruned these acacia trees. And then the, the shadows of these pruned trees were quite interesting. Now, she could easily carry that in her hand, but she doesn't want to. Okay, here's a sequence. Now, that's heavy. You can see from the effort in his face. He's got no cushion up there. And here's a sweet potato man. Thank you.